course, the Royal Sovereign was helicopter. That was the first helicopter relief on the Sovereign. The Bristol's used to do it before this helicopter. And they used to land you on New Haven Beach, and that got organised, and you went from Shoreham Airport because of um, fire control. You know. So that was the first helicopter relief from the Sovereign. And the Sovereign, you say you saw it more or less being built? I was with it being built, yeah. I was with the contractors eleven months on the beach at New Haven. That must have been an odd post in them to... It was, yeah. I used to uh, have weekend leave and go back Monday and go home Friday, you know. It was a, like office hours. <laughs> you just kept things going, you know, with the contractors. And, uh, you were sort of posted to a lighthouse, but there wasn't a lighthouse built. Yes, in a way, yeah, as you were working up and getting used to the equipment, and uh, then you had to uh, store the place up gradually, and uh, off we went. Uh, I haven't got dates to hand, I've got them, but um, the base was towed out to the Royal Sovereign site on the safe bank. And uh, the winter set in and the top had to be towed down to Portsmouth until such maybe three or four months, February month I think it was, we had to be towed back up, placed over the base and jacked up. So it's quite experience really. Um, Duke of Ember, the master, he flew his helicopter out to visit us. That was quite interesting. Uh, things went there. We had the coat of arms and the light vessel that was put on the Sovereign Tower. That was a one off uh, building. Uh, they were going to build more, I think, and the Lambie boys came in. And um, that uh, squashed that idea. Christiane Nielsen built it. They were going to build a steel structure. And uh, they said they could build a concrete structure and steel combined for the same price. So, they're quite a nice building, really. What did you think of the inside then? Oh, it was, um, it was all balanced out, as you can imagine, you know, for weight. Uh, engine room balanced the um, water um, tank out, and the engines balanced the uh, the uh, rest, rest of the building, it was all balanced, and the tower all had to be balanced. And uh, uh, we had a little bit of trouble jacking up because they were drinking our water, you see. Our weight was getting used for the contractor's builders, you see. And uh, uh, we had to get the Patricia, she was passing, and give us some water. And then they had it in barrels, they couldn't pump it to us, no, the old Patricia. And, uh, anyway, we eventually got jacked up and uh, everything went well after that. And what was it actually like to be in in, in bad weather, you were saying? Uh, we had one bad spell. We had a, over a 70 knot wind, took away the deck lockers, and, and it used to trip the light with a vibration. It used to be that sort of trouble. Took away uh, the lockers, you say? Yeah, deck lockers we had on deck. T what, deck what? lockers, they were, um, they contained um, uh, safety gear for the helicopters and that, and uh, rescue gear, you know. Is that blown away or washed yeah, away? Yeah, blown away, blown away, yeah, no, yeah. that took away. Did you get much seas up that thing or? Uh, got up to the um, radio room one splashing up, I wouldn't say it was an actual sea. The place was built for a 500 year wave, you know, so it was all planned out. You know. That was any real uh, sea I saw there. What was it like inside it in the storm and did it move like a tank? Yes, oh yeah, it, did. it was quite frightening and uh, at one time we had the, um, uh, it was a yacht race going to France and one got stung underneath us, woke us all up, we wondered what was happening, we thought the foundation had gone to casing, you know, but opened the workshop door and was always sparking, the masthead lights were sparking against the iron work around the lighthouse. Uh, got in touch ashore, as it happened, we were having a new t uh, radio telephone put in at the time and I had to get the uh, radio mechanic out to connect us up to get the message ashore. We had the VHF telephone as well and uh, they launched the lifeboat and they contacted uh, Coaster, the motor vessel Dublin. And uh, I think the yacht's name was Battle Axe, I think, Battle Cry. And she dismasted, she let go of her mast, shed her mast that was hanging underneath and she was going down the channel and the lifeboat chasing her <laughs> and the little coaster. So, and that ripped a lot of the um, 
uh, what shall I say, the walkway around the lighthouse away, and that would be um, rebuilt, which must have been a job really because it was suspended out. Uh, then I left the Royal Sovereign there, so I never saw the completion of that. Mr. Vennings, he was the engineer in charge of that job. But it must have been a feat to carry out, you know. You said the, mm. the storms on that was a bit frightening inside. What was the movement like then on it? Um, it's kind of jarring, you know, you get a southwest sea, it, used to, it took some of the fenders away as well, you know, but um, it was only sheer weight holding it there, it wasn't uh, fixed to a rock like the towers, you know, just sheer weight. So is that there was a case thing? in there filled with sand, you know, that weighted you there, you know, and I believe the um, southeast corner used to scour out, they used to put divers down every year just to inspect it, you know. They put a lot of rubble down there to stop the scarring. You know. So we were actually on the bank to replace the light vessel. Right, there's the door we just came through from the gallery and up there is the lighthouse. Right, we'll go around the gallery just to show you what it's like. We're about 60-65 uh, feet up here from the water. It's a bit windy today. We're now going past the watch room just in there you an idea where we are. When we turn this corner it's going to be windy and we'll be looking into the sun. That's the way we just came and we're going back on this side all the way around. That's the only other way up to the deck above. And the object you see coming up on the right that's a, a life raft in case we have to abandon ship. Just passing the lounge and we're now passing the kitchen. So we're on the west side at the moment. We're then going to turn onto the south down there. There's the way we just came along there. Right back this way, quite windy on the corner. Whoops, that's it gone. Now we're passing bedrooms now and one's in use. So keep quiet for a while. Right, that's the life raft we're just passing by my bedroom window. Just passing the mechanics quarters and then the battery charger room and on our left is now the battery room. When we go around this corner, it's going to be windy again. This is the dark side today. That's where we just came from down there around this way, passing that door on the left, which is the battery room. The net's above us, 
helicopter to stop you falling into the sea if you get blown off the deck above during helicopter work or just get careless and uh, step back and admire the view the land in front of us to our right is the uh, Hastings and you've got Eastbourne to the left right around this corner that's the one we just came down here's the corner bringing us back to where we started from and there's the door Have you had any memorable storms at sea then, on Royal Hervis? Yes, the um, most memorable was on the Royal Sovereign. It was a gale roughly from the south, and it was fairly consistently storm force, and the wind was often going into hurricane force. It went on for quite a, a long time, several hours, if not a day or two and some very large, short, high seas developed. And due to the construction of the Royal Sovereign, um, it being a stressed steel and concrete structure, it does have quite a lot of flex in it, and it does flex and rattle and bang about quite a lot. And it doesn't give you a very good feeling of security. So I remember that one very well. So what equal movements is it doing during this? The lesser movements of the place which are common in high swells or in gales are a gentle lurching and smaller rocking movements such as you might experience on a train. As it gets worse things tend to sort of rattle and bang about a little bit and when large steep waves hit the uh, caisson uh, of the station underwater, the uh, vibration is transmitted up and it feels like somebody hitting the underside of the floor with a sledgehammer. So quite a violent movement? Yes, at times. Not, in a, not so much in an ordinary gale, but in the sort of storm force and upwards from there, it's, it is quite a, a violent movement. In 1991, I did a tour of duty on this lighthouse. I was filling in for somebody that was off sick. I went on board with a Barry Lingwood, assistant keeper Barry Lingwood, and already on board was Keith Simmons acting as keeper in charge. Prior to me going on board earlier on in that year, in 91, we had a storm that was getting into hurricane force. It done extensive damage throughout Britain. Three million trees were downed. 3.37 billion pounds was what it cost the insurers for the damage done everywhere. Keith said that in the winter, the sovereign moves and jumps around quite a lot with lots of quite violent movements but during the hurricane it was quite different. Keith said the sea was blown flat so no big waves but the sheer power of the wind was really shaking the structure. At times it was so violent that walking about was a problem as your feet left the ground from time to time. Keith also said he thought he knew all the moves in in storms, but this night new ones were invented. 
he reckons the biggest movements of all was one of whiplash as the whole tower shook. At night when it was time to go to bed he had to try and sleep with one hand holding the side of the bed as the violent whiplash would literally throw you out of bed. During the early 90s, when I was doing most of my filming of the lighthouses, I tried desperately to get out to Beachy Head Lighthouse to film, but uh, as the place had already been automated in 1983 and the keepers removed, it was uh, getting quite tricky to, to link up times when I was free from duty and when people were actually going out there doing any maintenance work. So by the time my redundancy caught up with me, I had never gone to Beachy Head to film the inside. However, when I was down in the early 90s to film Dungeness, I managed to slip away and film the outside of Beachy Head from the cliff top just to do preparatory work, thinking that I would get permission to go on board but that never happened. Fast forward to 2011 and Trinity House had decided they weren't going to repaint Beachy Head um, in its normal stripes and they were going to allow it to slowly go back to its original granite grey colour. So along came a Shirley Moff who instigated the Save the Stripes campaign and on board pretty soon came a Rob Wassell and along with lots of other people they instigated some fundraising and raised £27,000 Trinity House part funded the rest as the total cost of painting the lighthouse was to be £45,000 so they were then able to repaint the lighthouse which happened in 2013. Rob was allowed to go on board at that time and photograph all the inside and the work going on. Fast forward to the early 2020s. I approached Trinity House to try and finish my lighthouse quest and Although they allowed me to go to a couple of island lights, they refused point blank for me to go to Beachy Head or the Nab Tower. I then discovered Rob Wassell's website, 
contacted him and he has very kindly allowed me to use his photographs to enable this video to be completed. I've also had help from the Association of Lighthouse Keepers, the ALK, who have kindly lent me some photographs to use as well. The video starts with some of my video footage of the outside of the lighthouse which I took in the early 90s whilst I was down filming Dungeness. Well, Beachhead, I mean, that was a, um, in my estimation, that was a real lighthouse. I mean, you had the, the IOB light, the fog gun, um, we had a very good skipper, and AK there, so uh, you fitted in well. Uh, the beauty was that once a week you could get ashore for your groceries. You rang up the, the um, the butcher in Meads and the, the grocer, the post office, they had everything ready for you, so you just nipped in. You were only allowed one tide, so you'd nip in, get everything together and get back again as quick as ever you could. Um, that was the beauty about that, because you could get fresh veg every week, fresh bread, you know. Mm. Um, what sort of year was this, era? Oh, well, I was... I've been in about 12 months then. So still in the 50s? Yeah, yeah. So what were the conditions like? Did, you didn't have electricity, did you? Uh, no, we didn't have electricity, but um, we did have the uh, the wind generator for the, the TV. Yeah. The, the people in Eastbourne bought us a little, I think it was a, a nine-inch echo TV, and uh, they gave us four six-volt car batteries. <coughs> and uh, we made some boxes up to carry them, carry them in, in uh, out of old charge boxes. Mm. And uh, while two were away and these cars being charged, we were using the others. But it only allowed you an hour's viewing every night, mm. mainly the news and one other program, and then that would be it. Until I mean, some uh, if we had a ways and means of getting them into uh, Meads where we used to take the old radio accumulator to be charged, fair dues, you know, we could have had it done. But who's going to cart two car batteries along the beach, and, <laughs> along there, you know, right up in the Meads. If it had been done by boat, out of Eastbourne, right round, you know, to the lighthouse, it'd been okay. But I, I, I enjoyed beach here, and I think it was a good lighthouse. So does that mean you had tilly lamps and stuff like that? Yeah, the old tilly lamps, uh, in the winter, got it give the, the lighthouse or the kitchen that and uh, the tower that little bit of extra warmth but in the wind in the summer uh, when you had to have the windows open and the old moths were round round the lamp <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> it's a bit different you know um, I mean the fog gun that was a bit frightening at first because you see at Harridge that a uh, they had one rigged up in a, a yard there, but he was only allowed to use detonators, was the instructor. So when you first went out to a, a real lighthouse with uh, real charges, you know, and you bang one of these, I wonder what the hell's gone wrong? And especially being under beach head with all the, the cliffs echoing it, you know, yeah. it just multiplied the sound a little bit more. But yeah, it was interesting. So what's the routine for Sounding for fog then, how, how do you go about it? Um, well, the routine was that uh, you were on lantern watch, so you'd have to go and call out the guy who was on fog watch, you see, he was like practically day off. Yeah. So you, you, you were ending up doing like a double shift. Um, if it was foggy in the afternoon, you'd put the light on an hour earlier than the normal light up time. If it was still foggy in the morning, you'd leave it on an hour longer. Mm -hmm. Leave the main light on. 
But when you finish your lantern watch, when you put the light out, then you take over the fog watch and the other guy will go back to bed or wherever. Um, it was easy, you know, some people complained. I know, I think, was it Eddie Stone? I think it was Eddie Stone. They used to have to have out, they had outside loading, where you had to load the charges on the outside, where Beachy, you just had a couple of little hatchways and you just open them up, and put your hands through and you could get all of the tumbler and clip your charge on and wind it back up again. But you couldn't fire a charge while the arm was down. The only time that would fire was when the arm was absolutely perpendicular and then it made contact at the top. The first station where after Dungeness Beachhead was an IOB and Alderney was an IOB and then back to Beachhead and I was at Beachhead when they uh, converted the station. Because at Beachhead when I went to Beachhead there was no electricity at all. It was still a Rayburn cooker, tilly lamps and all paraffin and clockwork. There was no elect, you know, it's like black hole of Calcutta on a night. That would be uh, 1974. So what, what would their uh, normal walks be like? Right? No, what did you have to do? Well, you had to sit in the kitchen all the time because there was no no power anywhere. So there were two tilly lamps in the kitchen and a ray burn. So the three keepers stuck in the kitchen. You used to get, uh, it was very, what called snug, if not, if not red hot. Uh, but anywhere else in the tower, you couldn't go anywhere else because it was a, a torch job, crawling around in the dark, yeah. And every hour we had to go up and wind up. So I take it, it was um, days of bucket and chuck it as well? Oh no, they actually had a toilet there and it even worked, which was a bit of a luxury for uh, that tower rock, yeah. But the beauty about Beachhead was on the low tides, you could at least get outside and once a, maybe once a fortnight, have a walk into Eastbourne. As long as you were quick, it was a good brisk, a good brisk hour's walk. Grab the, grab the mail, a bit of groceries, and then mar march back before the tide cut you off again. Uh, I joined just at about the right time when it went. I joined at the time when it went from two months on, month off to one month on, one month off. I think two months out on some of these places was. Well, looking at some of the old guys, I think they were a bit stir crazy at the finish. Yeah. How was it like to grub up for that amount of time? Well, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Vegetables were the main thing. You get, well, I mean, you got to change over at the middle of the month, but the diet could get a bit bland and monotonous, especially somewhere like Beachhead, there was no uh, power. So all we had was two paraffin fr tiny paraffin fridges, so there was no freezer facilities. So uh, after about a fortnight, all the veggie got a bit withered up. So you were sort of, it did basically the diet of the dreaded Dutch white cabbages and swede uh, and, and spud uh, Whereas uh, it was nice, but yeah, it was. It could get a bit monotonous, your diet. I think nowadays everybody's got freezers and microwaves, and people are a bit more ambitious with their cooking. Or look at some of the concoctions you see. Because now, when we all cook for ourselves now, some some concoctions look a bit ambitious, but I don't know what they are. So the meat then, you didn't have fridges in some of the places and for two months. How how much did the meat? Well, they had they had paraffin fridges and it was to turn up high and they would freeze, but you were pretty restricted.